yours. Oh, I have one right here. Okay. Well, Unless I marked it. I just marked mine so that it wouldn't read the conversation. Oh, sure. Do you want to, so a couple things. After, after announcements, would you pass it off to Tim? Good morning and welcome. Before we get into service here and begin, we're going to start off with some gathering music. So continue to find a bulletin, find a nice comfortable seat, grab a cup of coffee, right? I think it's last call here pretty soon before service starts. Um, yeah, continue saying hi. We are going to share one not often done here in the Black Hymnal, but a lovely one nonetheless. This is What Does the Lord Require of You? Join us for our processional hymn for the healing of the nations.
Good morning, <clears throat> and welcome to Indianola First United Methodist Church, and welcome to those of you who are joining us online this morning. My name is Mary Corsair, and it is wonderful to welcome you to church this morning on this bright and warmer Sunday. A reminder to please fill out the black attendance pads in your pews so that we know you are here. And additionally, if you are a guest, we invite you to visit the welcome desk at the back after the service and pick up a welcome packet that's in the little basket back there. It just contains a little bit more information about our church. A reminder that in light of the current Omicron surge and Bishop Lori Haller's recommendations, our administrative council asks that we wear a mask and socially distance while at church. Together, we must do our best to promote public health while also attending to our church's spiritual and community needs. If you have any questions about the Administrative Council's discussion and decision, please feel free to contact our church staff or a member of the Administrative Council. The worship committee invites you to volunteer in worship this spring. This is an easy way for you and your family to contribute to the life of the church and to connect with our congregation. There are many different jobs that you could help with from lighting the altar candles to serving communion. Check your inbox for a message from the church with a link to sign up or find Zach or visit the welcome desk where there's an iPad available for you to sign up after the service. Our Bible Town Students and Mission Committee are teaming up to be the good. They invite you to bring a canned food item or donation for Helping Hand, and at the same time, vote for your favorite team to win the Super Bowl, or should I say, soup or bowl. Donations are accepted through Super Bowl Sunday, February 13th. In February, there will also be two opportunities to gather information and converse about what it means for First UMC to be a church that welcomes and embraces all people. The first is on Wednesday evening this week, February 9th at 6.30. And the second will be next, um, no, not next Sunday, two Sundays from today on February 20th at 1130, both in the hospitality room. Child care will be available on Wednesday evening this week. Next week, we celebrate Valentine's Day as Pastor Trevor joins us once again to lead worship. During our 9 a.m. service, our K-5 through Bible Town kids will join us in the service to share a song and a special Valentine's Day gift. Come celebrate this day of love with us. And now I believe Pastor Tim has an announcement. Morning. Um, we have an opportunity uh, to, uh, to share in prayer um, on the um, Welcome Center is a, a prayer blanket which has been uh, uh, brought for Kelly Bonas, who is uh, dealing with significant health issues. And um, we would like to ask, as you feel led, following the service, if you would um, uh, pray, go, go to where that blanket is and offer a prayer for Kelly. And so that when she receives that blanket, uh, she knows that people from each of our worship services this morning were praying for her. And so uh, I, I know that her and her family would appreciate that. It gives you an opportunity to uh, tangibly pray for someone you know who has a need. And now if we, you would please stand as you are able and greet one another as we have been greeting during these times with a wave and a smile. And now please remain standing as you are able and join me in our opening prayer. 
Dear God, we thank you that we are all your children through Christ. Help us to remember that being your children means that we are all part of the same family, siblings in Christ, and that we should love and accept one another. Amen. Please remain standing for our opening song. This is a wonderful setting of the prayer of St. Francis. This is Make Me a Channel of Your Peace. Our psalm this morning is to be read responsively. I will read the part that's in lighter print, if you would join in the part that's in bold. And so from Psalm 100, we read, Make a joyful noise to the Lord all the earth. Know that the Lord is God. It is he that made us. And we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. This has been the word of the Lord.
Amen. Thank you, Handbell Choir. I always so enjoy hearing you all help lead us in worship through music. Uh, today, um, as I share with you all, both here in person and online, uh, we are reading from Paul's letter to the Galatians in the uh, third chapter, beginning at verse 26. I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version this morning. For in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. As many of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male or female. For all of you are one in Christ. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, today, uh, Pastor Trevor and I are starting a sermon series, which we are doing together jointly. Uh, Pastor Trevor is preaching the same series at Milo and Farmer's Chapel. And in fact, next Sunday, he and I will swap pulpits and I will preach at Farmer's and Milo and he'll be sharing the second sermon in this three-part series with you all. Um, this is the basics of the series is going off the scripture from Micah that we do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with God. And often it's occurred to me that when we talk about um, the topics of justice, mercy, and our personal walk with God, lots of times we seem to break those up into three topics like they're not really related to each other. Like justice is all by itself and you would have justice if you didn't have mercy. Or mercy is all by itself, but if you were merciful, there's no justice. Or, or you can be just with act without actually walking humbly with God, which doesn't seem too likely to me. These, these three pieces interact in kind of our journey and walk of the Christian faith. The other thing is, um, we often talk about justice in big, broad stroke kind of discussions, which are important, but often as individuals that you and I can't do much with. Um, you know, for example, talking about racism or sexism. Um, you and I as individuals can't fix our national problem of racism. We can't fix sexism. We, we can't fix a lot of other areas of discrimination that people deal with as a whole. And so the tendency is to talk in broad strokes and then not talk very much about what you and I can do because we know we can't fix the big problem by ourselves. And so I wanted to share kind of what I see as kind of a practical approach to us as Christians in talking about needs of justice. Now, the passage I just read about out of Galatians is about Paul dealing with a church that's diverse, and it has divisions based on that diversity. There are Jewish Christians in the congregation, Greek Christians. Um, there are... Uh, people who, who are quite well off and people who are literally, in this passage, slaves in the church. There are people of all kinds of backgrounds, but Paul says that when they come together in the church, they're one people. They're all children of Abraham, all heirs of Christ. And so I think one of the ways that we can think about how we treat others is try to think of those situations that you and I have been in when we felt like we were the outsider or the other or the person, kind of the odd person out in a group. Now, you know, we're very similar to each other in a lot of ways when we gather in this group here. Um, and so, so it's easy to get comfortable 
with that. When I was in college, I had the opportunity to uh, spend an, an entire summer uh, working in a black congregation. And I wasn't the only Anglo person in the church, but not far from it. And I was living in an, a neighborhood w where I was a minority uh, and, and working there. And one of the things that I discovered real quickly is I, because I had grown up in white suburbia in St. Louis, that you, you know, if you're in the majority, you get pretty comfortable and used to being in the majority and you just kind of swim with everybody else in the, in the same uh, stream and everybody kind of knows how things work and what things are like. And, and so you've got a comfort level that comes from that. But I found out for the first time as a young person what it was like to not be in the majority. Now, this church worked very hard to make me very comfortable. They were some of the sweetest people I'd ever worked with. They, they were kind and they were, they, they were uh, generous and they were easy to be with. But the church was different uh, because of, of their culture. The, the worship service was quite a bit different than what I was used to. They had one Sunday morning service on Sunday and it went for nearly two hours. Uh, and about the first half of it was music. And they wanted 45 minute sermons. No, I kid you not. They were serious about that. They wanted 45 minute sermons. That takes some doing, by the way, to do 45 minute sermons. Um, but I felt different. It even happened to me when I was there. I was walking through the neighborhood one day because we were putting some postcards and stuff out and inviting people to church um, on doors. I had a police officer stop me and ask me if I was lost. He didn't mean theologically speaking. He, he, he thought I had walked into, quote, the wrong neighborhood because I didn't look like everybody else in the neighborhood. And I said, no, no, no. I'm living down the street three blocks over here with Pastor so-and-so. Oh, okay. So even though people worked very hard to make me feel very comfortable, it was different, right? Maybe you've had the experience of walking into a church that's far different from one you've ever worshipped in and having some discomfort. I remember visiting a congregation on vacation one day. I was by myself, and, and I didn't know what door to go in. Doors all kind of looked alike. Uh, well, there's a couple of big red doors. On some churches, a big red door means you're near the sanctuary. So I'm going to go in the big red doors and found myself standing right in the middle of the ch children's wing. Kids running up and down the hall. There are adults there. Suddenly, I'm looking confused and perplexed and a little bit nervous because I'm wondering if they're going to think, what's this guy we don't know doing standing right in the middle of the children's wing? And thankfully, a member of the church, I assume it was a member, the person who seemed to be a Sunday school teacher, came up to me and said, are, what are you looking for? I'm looking for the sanctuary. I, I thought I'd come to worship today. Oh, wonderful, she said. And we went down, and, and instead of just pointing me and giving me directions, because by the way, in this building, this is a problem too. If I'm standing by the church office and try to give somebody directions, say, to room 216, they might not make it. So often it's better to walk a person there. This person walked me far enough that she could point to the sanctuary and say, there it is. Now, I'll tell you something. I'm a pastor. I'd been pastoring for a lot of years even when I made this visit. For about 10 seconds, I almost panicked. I almost went right back out those red doors back to my car because I felt completely out of place and I didn't know what I was doing. And that's a clergy person. I thought, well, you know, how many people would have turned around because there was just no signage? But also, if that person had not been welcoming, if that person had been accusatory, and what are you doing standing here? I might not have stayed for worship either. Maybe you've walked into a service and sat down and you didn't know which hymnal to pick up. There's a prayer book and you don't know what page you should be on. People stand, people sit, people kneel, and you're not really sure when. If you've ever had that experience, you might understand what a guest feels like when they come into our building and they've never been in one of our worship services and don't know how things work. 
That's when our attentive ears and eyes are so important to being kind and helping a first person feel welcomed, to feel a part. Well, you're thinking, what does that have to do with justice? Well, at the heart of it, justice has a lot to do with us stepping into the shoes of other people and seeing to, seeking to treat them with kindness and grace. Maybe you have been uh, in a store, Hy-Vee or someplace else, and, and saw someone who looked different. Maybe uh, they were wearing a hijab, and so you had the thought that they might uh, be of another faith than you and I are. Have you ever thought that they might be uncomfortable? And, and maybe a smile, how are you doing this morning, might make a big difference in their lives. You see, lots of times people feel like the outsider, and we just don't always notice it. Sometimes people are made outsiders on purpose, because we're not comfortable. Maybe you've been in a church also, I've made enough church visits to know. Have you ever walked into a church and it was cold in there, and I'm not talking about the air conditioning? where people looked at you like, and why are you here? The truth is, is a lot of people decide whether they're going to come into a church and stay or not, or if they're ever going to come to a second service, in about the first 30 seconds they're there. If they feel too uncomfortable, if they don't feel like somebody gives them some welcome or guidance, it's probably the last time you're going to see them. Because they just didn't feel like they fit in. When we put ourselves in other people's places, then we can start to empathize with what they're going through and what they're experiencing and, and recognize that maybe there are things that we can do to help them. But the reason you can't separate equality or justice from mercy or, or walking humbly with God is if, you don't, if you're not a person of faith at all, you may or may not care if anybody else is uncomfortable or if anybody else is having a good experience. You see, a good bit of our world teaches the idea, as long as you get your own and as long as I get my own, it's fine. I got what I wanted. I don't care if anybody else is uncomfortable. It's our bedrock belief as Christians that all of us are children of God, which actually causes us to care about things like racial discrimination or profiling or or mistreatment of people. And this is something the church has dealt with for generations, not just new, new things. One of the things that I have never experienced as a pastor, never, I can say this with certainty, I have never had a person come up to me and say, I'm not sure you should be a pastor. I mean, should men really be pastors? I have never had that happen, not once. But when I talk to women clergy, and particularly women clergy who are near retirement age or retired, who, so they were earlier in the work of our conference and, and ministry, you could be, if you've not heard them, shocked by the stories about how some women in ministry were treated by good Christian folks when they became pastors for the first time in a church. Harassed mistreated, their call questioned, their, their credentials questioned. I've never had experiences like that. And when you hear it from, from people, it makes you realize that, that issues of justice and mercy and walking with God are nothing new. When we're confronted with something different, often as human beings, our first reaction is to react negatively. Now, I think it is important to think then where we can make practical differences. There are a lot of hurting people out there. A lot of people in our community who feel really in difficult spots. And I think certainly during this period of COVID-19, it's maybe even more true. People feel really pressured 
I can't imagine right now what it's like to work in a hospital. I am not yet allowed to make hospital calls, just so that you know. Um, they don't, they're not letting clergy in to make hospital calls because they're letting in very few visitors. It's something I miss doing very much. It's an important ministry, but it's not safe right now. And, um, and I hear stories, uh, on, you know, read them online, hear them directly of what, what people who are working in hospitals are going through for their level of stress right now. There are people who are working in service jobs, folks who work in grocery stores and, and stores and who, who, have been, who feel pressure and, and, and who feel kind of pushed about. Customers complaining about a mask or complaining about this or that that they have no control over because they're a cashier, you know. Sometimes I go into hy V, and if I go into hy V, uh, um, there are some things that are inevitable. I will get in the wrong line. Whichever line I pick, it's going to end up being the one that takes the longest. It's inevitable. It must be part of Murphy's Law or something. The other thing that's inevitable is if I'm in a hurry and I think I really was just going to dash into hy V and grab a thing or two and dash out, inevitably, somebody in front of me is going to count out their payment of their groceries one penny at a time. Inevitably. And sometimes when I see that, I start to feel a little uncomfortable. I try to hold hold back on that, but sometimes people don't. I've seen people get very grumpy. This is taking too long. I'm in a hurry. I gotta be someplace. And often they take that out on the cashier, who has no control over what other people are doing, but may end up having a pretty rotten day. Your words of kindness, caring, can actually make a difference in somebody's life. And so when you get to that cashier who's looking really worn out and, 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 and has been standing there for 10 hours, if you can smile or say a kind word, commiserate with them, let them know, yeah, boy, there's just a lot of people here today, aren't there? It's crowded in here. You must be busy you might make a huge difference in a person's life. You might have opportunity to stand up for somebody in a simple way. I think we get overwhelmed with the big picture justice issues because you and I know, while they're very important, we don't know as individuals what to do. And as individuals, a lot of what we have to do is start ourselves with kindness, with understanding, with putting ourselves in another person's shoes and trying to understand what they might be experiencing and let them tell us what they're experiencing. I didn't know what women clergy have experienced until women told me what they'd experienced. And then I just couldn't, couldn't imagine. And, and it made me want to be even more supportive of what they do. And by the way, some of the best preachers I have ever heard are women, including our own bishop, Lori Howard. So we, we have this opportunity as Christians to do that, but what causes us to do it is our faith in Christ. There is no justice off by itself, our justice is based on faith. It's funny, people think that the words in the Constitution or, or the Declaration of Independence about freedom and justice actually um, uh, just materialized out of nowhere, but they came from the ideas of people often of faith. Now, I'm not saying we're a Christian nation. No, we're a nation where everybody has freedoms and everybody chooses their own faith and, and, or no faith if that's what they choose. But look at passages like this passage in Galatians. Another passage in Galatians, Paul said, for freedom Christ has set us free. Let us not be bound again by a yoke of slavery. Ideas of freedom and caring and concern are very biblical ideas. Very biblical ideas. Beyond being just American ideas. 
So as Trevor and I sh work through what it means to, to do justice and love mercy and walk humbly with God, I feel such a connection between all of these. By the way, it's one of the things I like about being a United Methodist Christian. There are some denominations that very strongly represent the personal faith of the individual. That's a strong emphasis in their denominational background. And some other denominations really strongly emphasize ministries of justice as their main focus. But United Methodists seem to try to strike a balance. John Wesley talked about personal and social holiness, and that they were connected. That you're not going to be have a, a real deep personal holiness if you're not seeking to be good to others in the community, but also you're probably not going to seek to be good to other people in the community if you don't have an inward faith that makes you recognize that God loves everyone and that everyone is, is a child of God. That balance of how we worship God and how we treat our neighbor is really important to our faith. And I think it's an important part of who we want to be as a church. Everyone feels like they would feel welcome here. So when you're wandering the halls of this church, because you know the church like the back of your hand probably, and you see somebody who doesn't look like they're sure where they're going, please be that person who said, hey, can I help you find something? Or when you're in high V, standing behind an impatient person, be that person who gives a smile and a greeting. When you're with a person and you recognize someone who is standing there and maybe feels like they totally don't fit in, be that person who says a kind word to them. A smile and an encouragement and is ready to help. To me, that's a lot about what it means to be a Christian. Not that we can understand what everyone's going through, but that we can empathize with their feelings and their hurts and their sorrows and be a small light of brightness in their life that might cause them to see the greater light of God working in them. This is a tough world we live in a world that encourages selfishness, a world that encourages individuality. But the church is here to encourage community, to encourage grace, and to cultivate God's love. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you call us to live justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly with God. Help it to start, Lord, with our personal faith in Jesus that wells up in us and recognizes that everyone is a child of God that you love. Help us, Lord, to keep our eyes open by the Holy Spirit to see people who are hurting and in need, people who feel left out, people who feel like the other in the midst of a crowd. Help us be the ones who give a kind word, who give guidance, who give help. Help us represent Jesus in all that we do. Help us to share your love and your grace. In Christ's name, amen. This time we're going to share in a hymn of reflection.
this time our ushers are going to come as we share together in our offering. Give as Christ leads you for the upbuilding of God's church. Bless these gifts, bless those who have given, and help us to remember that you have given us all. In Christ's name, amen.
Please be seated as we prepare to share together in Holy Communion this morning. Um, I wanted to um, always, as we talk about the church being a place of love and welcome for all people, uh, to always remind you that the Lord's Table, uh, Communion, is a sacrament that is open to all. You don't have to be part of this church. You don't have to be part of any church, in fact, to take communion. God invites you to Christ's table. Um, during uh, this current season of the, of the church, we're taking communion um, primarily using these disposable uh, communion elements. Um, there's grape juice on one side. Uh, there's a gluten-free wafer on the other side. Probably the only thing is just to remember that the juice is up when you take the top off the juice. Other than that, you should do pretty well. They're not too hard to peel. Um, the liturgy says wine, but in most United Methodist churches, we use, we use grape juice, and that's what's in these. Um, as we share together, we'll share in the great thanksgiving, then people will come forward, and you'll receive the individual uh, communion elements, and you, then you take that back to your pew uh, to consume it. Uh, so we're going to share now in the great thanksgiving, the liturgy that we share at the Lord's table. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Almighty God, Creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread and he gave thanks to you and he broke the bread and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for, in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink this, do this in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice and union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit, Lord, on us gathered here. And on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. And now let us pray together with the confidence of the children of God. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As Christ's body was broken for us, we do break this bread. As Christ shed his very lifeblood for us, we lift the cup of salvation. Pat's going to come forward to help me sh uh, share, and then you can come as, uh, as Christ leads you.
body and blood of Christ given for you. Is there anyone else who would like me to bring bring you one uh, directly? And if you if you were unable to come down, more than happy to do that if you need it. It's a joy to gather together at the Lord's table as we share. It's one of the places of visible unity in the church that I find so meaningful. One of the days I pray for is the day when all churches will feel that they can commune together. We're not there yet, but we're closer to that than we used to be. And may God work in that way in all of us. Or please stand for our closing song together. Our closing song comes from neither our red or black hymnal, but from the green hymnal from the Methodist Church, which is not yet in our pews, but is perhaps one that you know we have shared it uh, a number of times, and the words are on the screen. This is the terrific song, A Place at the Table.
without fear and simply to be. To work, to speak out, to witness and worship for everyone God, no right to be free. Help us, Lord, to share love and grace and justice with all people, a love and justice that wells up out of our faith in Christ. Send us out to perform acts of love and grace and kindness in this world. Help us to be a people who embrace all because you embrace all. In Christ's name, amen.